So we're here today with Matt Canigliero and James Parker Flynn, both appellate specialists at Carlton Fields who have participated in live jury trials during COVID. Uh, I think we should begin by starting, just giving us your overview of what it was like to participate in a live jury trial during COVID. Matt, why don't you go ahead and start? Well, happy to to give a try here. The The trial I participated in was a multi-week trial in Miami. I was there as appellate support and it was very, very different with all of the, the different precautions being taken because of COVID. Uh, we can probably get into some of the details, but just at a big picture level, everyone had to wear masks. Everyone had to be socially distanced throughout the trial. Uh, it created issues with, with spacing and placement uh, for jurors, for the attorneys, for witnesses, and created issues with being able to hear, being able to see, uh, the flow of things, uh, the kind of equipment that was used in the courtroom. Uh, it was really a, just a bunch of different, I mean, not to the jury, I think to the jurors, they, none of them had been in a trial before. So it was all just different and sort of new to them because it was. But for the, the attorneys and maybe even for the judge, uh, all of this was not the way we normally handle a trial. Yeah, and that was about the same experience I had. I was also at a multi-week trial providing appellate support in Bradenton, Florida, and and just the basic uh, same outcome there. There was uh, a lot of differences than what you would have seen before COVID, as far as the spacing, as far as the the mask wearing, and, and it impacted you know not just the the jury and the judge and um, and the attorneys obviously, but also you know the judge's staff. Um, the deputies, everyone in the courthouse um, was sort of dealing with this. And, and in general, it was just a different environment. The courthouse itself was uh, much quieter than I'm used to seeing with far fewer people sort of coming in and out uh, th than usual. Um, and so, like Matt said, we can get into sort of the specifics as we go. But, but it was sort of a new experience for everyone, for the jurors, since most of them had never served on a jury, uh, and for everyone else uh, who had uh, significant trial experience, just having to adjust to a whole new world. Did the court limit the amount of people in the courtroom? I've been hearing stories of you could have a big trial team, especially in multi-week trials. Did the court limit the amount of attorneys that could be in the courtroom at a particular time? And were others like in a side room preparing? I, I can say, Chrissy, that at the trial I was at, the court did have some limitations on the amount of people that could be in the courtroom. Uh, it did not impact the trial teams themselves, uh, which had you know fairly significant um, amount of attorneys involved. Uh, the attorneys themselves were allowed to sit closely uh, during the trial, so they weren't having to be distanced, um, as well as all the support staff. Uh, but beyond that, anyone else that wanted to sort of be in the courtroom you had to get you know special permission from the, the judge. You had to, in advance, let the judge know who you were and that you would be coming and get that approval beforehand. So any interested people who might not you know be a part of one of the teams, uh, they couldn't just come in and watch like we might have normally seen. And so that might have impacted you know potential press coverage, uh, interested viewers or, or friends, things like that. Uh, but for us, anyways, it did not impact the ability of the attorneys to all be in the courtroom at the same time uh, with their clients. We were similar. The guards at the courthouse had a, a list of names. So if you weren't on the list, you couldn't get in the courthouse, let alone get in the courtroom. Within the courtroom itself, the attorneys were not distanced from each other on the same side. So counsel table had kind of the usual set of, of counsel or client there. But past that, it was uh, a lot of distancing. You could have... An, a good number of people in the courtroom, but a lot depended on how big your courtroom was. So the, the particular courtroom we were in uh, was fairly large. And so we didn't have troubles with being able to fit uh, council teams into the room. What was, what was jury selection like? I imagine, you know, when you have all of these people coming in um, to be questioned, there could be particular issues with that? What was jury selection like? And were there any issues that you thought about arose about preserving the record or getting answers um, 
forthcoming answers, things like that. I'll jump in. A lot of things were of concern during jury selection. One, just practically speaking, everything took longer. It just the, the basic lesson of COVID and all these precautions being utilized in a courtroom during a trial was expect everything to take twice as long. So jury selection took twice as long as it normally would. Uh, the you know we began with hardships, of course, and hardships took far more than twice as long, um, and and partly because people had more to say, and partly because you couldn't hear them say it. Everybody had a mask on, and at least the lawyers and the judge are folks who are somewhat used to speaking publicly and, and projecting, and and so while a mask is a challenge, it's it's not an impossible challenge. But for a lot of folks coming in off the street to serve as as, as jurors who are maybe not used to public speaking, uh, having to be in a courtroom where all of the jurors are, prospective jurors are distanced from each other and distanced from the attorneys, and then having to speak through a mask was really hard on them because it's rather common in an ordinary situation that you can't hear someone very well add masks into the equation and it becomes really difficult. So everything just took longer. Uh, and on top of that, they had some pretty good things to say about what was, you know, perhaps going to keep them out of a multi-week trial. And, you know, the COVID has just created crises in, in people's individual lives. And, and so there were more hardships than you probably would otherwise get. James, did you find that judges were, or your, the judge in your case, was more lenient with hardships than in another than they would normally be or was it about the same no absolutely the judge was probably more lenient than he would have otherwise have been um and as were the attorneys they were much more willing to agree that uh, a, a potential juror had a hardship and needed to be excused um and sort of building off what matt said that this you know COVID has presented a lot of crises a lot of the hardships created by it aren't just you know health related or or uh, you know, fear of getting COVID, not yet being vaccinated, needing to get vaccinated uh, during the trial, but also economic impacts from a lot of people who have been struggling over the past year and just really felt they could not concentrate on a trial thinking that they might not get the new job they were expecting to get or would not be able to support themselves um, if, if they had to serve. So those issues were there. Um, and so the judge was absolutely more lenient on that, which is part of the reason why, like Matt said, jury selection took so much longer and particularly the hardship part. I know that we went through something like 110 potential jurors to get to the six plus one we got to. Uh, and so we were just, you know, filtering people in and out every day, just, you know, 25, 30 at a time that had to be excused. Um, and then also as to the, the hearing that that was also an, uh, an issue that we had where it was just difficult to communicate. Uh, jury selection took place in a the extra large jury room that they had, so not in the courtroom, so they could get as many jurors in there at the same time while still being socially distanced. And so everyone's trying to project from, you know, 40 feet away, 50 feet away with air conditioning blowing and with uh, vending machines. So that whole process just took a long time. And, and frankly, a lot of the jurors uh, got, I think, more frustrated with it than they might have otherwise been. It, it was It was really sort of a, just a hardship on them being there for that uh, length of time to get through it. And I imagine that's a problem that's not going to go away quickly, even as things begin to return to normal because of concerns, health or economic concerns that have arisen in people's lives because of COVID. Um, what about this general setup of the courtroom and um opening statements. The, the law, did the lawyers have to wear masks while they were doing that? And if so, did it make it harder to understand? Uh, did you think that it was less effective or, you know, maybe had the same impact? So I'll jump in there. Um, on the first question, I think Matt already sort of hit it. The lawyers in the case I was involved in are, are you know, like most lawyers, they're, they're used to public speaking. They're used to projecting so I didn't think there was a lot of difficulty during openings in, in you know, being heard by the jury. Uh, but it, it did impact the sort of way things were presented, where the attorneys could stand in the courtroom in relation to the jury. 
The jury itself was spread out, not only in the jury box, but in front of the jury box to make sure they had enough space. Um, and and you, you just couldn't quite get the same movement that you might have otherwise seen. But I, I don't think that the, the attorneys themselves had difficulties while wearing their masks in projecting uh, to the jury during openings or, or closings, for that matter. You know, I think in the trial I did, it had a little more of an impact because even when lawyers are professional speakers, some folks are a little more quiet and maybe a little more uh, deliberate in how they use their voice and their inflection to sort of draw people in to listen and pauses and as opposed to having a just one big, constant, loud, static tone and, and, and level. And so I think that was affected by it because when you put a mask on, it's, it's hard to be heard unless you're really speaking very clearly and, and with some volume. Even, even so, your facial expressions, I imagine. A lot of attorneys in opening statements convey things through their mannerisms and facial expressions, which you wouldn't be able to see. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, in our case, the judge, I think, quickly perceived that uh, it was going to be hard for folks to hear. And I think folks were prodded to, to start using microphones. And what ended up happening rather quickly into the whole process was the lawyers started using like uh, lavalier mics and hooking them up basically to their masks. And that allowed everyone to be amplified and made things much easier for the jury to hear. Because not only is there a problem with you speaking, it's a problem with them hearing. In, in our case, the jury sat in the gallery because normally you'd be in a box, the jury box, which is great, except it's very hard to get six or so feet apart for everybody and still be in that area, at least in the courtroom we were in. So the judge had the jury, not just in, in jury selection, but during the trial itself, sit in the gallery and everyone was well spaced apart. But that meant that if you were counsel and you were uh, up in the area where attorneys normally were, uh, sort of in front of the bar, and you were speaking out into the gallery, you had to go rows and rows deep to be able to to make sure they heard you. And so the microphone- And also turn it and turn around and put your back towards the judge while you're speaking Oh yeah, to- it created angling issues the whole trial because you always were not ideally angled. The witness and the judge would be up at their normal place and the jury, instead of being somewhat next to them, was very far in the other direction. What about, in that setup, what about um, the use of demonstrative aids and exhibits? If they're not in a jury box, if you have a technologically equipped courtroom, sometimes you have the screen in front where they can see, you wouldn't have that in the gallery. So wh what were the difficulties in seeing exhibits? Or The short answer is it got added to the gallery. They, everyone set up screens. And so many, many screens around the courtroom for counsel, for the judge, for the witness, and for the jury. Yeah, this, the same at the trial. I was at a lot of screens. Uh, the jury primarily was looking at one large screen, though, that was um, because they were in, in the case I was in, they, that they were in the jury box or immediately in front of it. So it eliminated some of those angling issues. But the screen they were looking at, while large, uh, was on the other side of the courtroom. And so I think at times they still had a little bit of difficulty seeing uh, those exhibits, I don't know that it would have been significantly different for them during the trial than it might have otherwise been. Uh, but there was also just a difficulty with um, with the sort of the witnesses having to get a little bit used to reviewing the, the exhibits that way, not ever having any paper copies of anything. There was no paper copies handed back and forth. And so I think that at times was a little bit difficulty, uh, difficult, making sure everyone was on the same page, making sure whatever tech person was running the exhibits was able to quickly uh, get to the right place in the exhibit that matched with where the attorneys needed to go and where, what the witnesses needed to see. So there were some challenges there, although I give uh, a lot of kudos to the both the, the private tech staff and the court's tech staff for, for really handling it well and, and making it about as painless as possible. What about sidebars? So when I did trial support in a case that was being streamed and I was not there live, they couldn't do sidebars because you couldn't turn on the white noise and go up to the to the judge to discuss things. They actually had to 
either take a recess and let the jurors out of the room, which of course takes more time, or they would go out of the room. Did you guys have those issues? We we did not. The, the, they still did the normal sidebars. They were still able to use the white noise. Uh, so that did not uh, present a problem. We were similar. The judge, I don't think, needed white noise because the jury was so far from the bench. But it was difficult for the court reporter and it was difficult for the attorneys who were going to be arguing at sidebar. Everybody had to have a microphone or deal with their microphones or turn them off, turn them on. Uh, it, it Logistically, it was a, a whole set of issues that folks weren't used to. What about examining witnesses? Um, what sorts of issues arose there that may be different from a regular trial? Um, I think when we discussed this at the beginning, maybe, James, your witnesses didn't wear masks and Matt, yours did. What were the things that arose from from those issues just in, in, in the examination of witnesses? Yeah, I think the, uh, as you mentioned, the, the witnesses in, in our trial did not wear masks once they got on the stand. There was a plexiglass in front of them. So for the most part, the, the most difficult thing they had to deal with was, uh, again, not being able to review any paper exhibits. Um, the plexiglass itself occasionally would impact speaking. So the court reporter at times, I think, had a little bit more trouble hearing them than, than uh, he might have otherwise. Or the attorneys, you know, especially when they're not projecting to a jury, but they're sort of getting in the flow of asking questions. Occasionally, then the masks uh, impacted the clarity with which the words were coming out. Uh, and, and, and so the witnesses occasionally had a little bit more trouble understanding the attorneys at times. Uh, but th- those were the primary ones that I saw. I'll use this as a, a chance to speak to the larger issue of masks, it, not just for the witnesses who some had them, uh, but for the jurors and for the attorneys. And Christy, you kind of mentioned this earlier uh, about just in opening statements, how attorneys might be able to you know, use their 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 face and their their looks to convey messages without having necessarily to say them. And that's, you know, body language and facial reactions are a huge part, especially uh, in a jury trial. I mean, they're a huge part of, of everyday life, but boy, in a jury trial, they're extremely important. Uh, and that issue, it, it, it impacted the witnesses and being able to watch them and judge them and assess them. It impacted jury selection in how do you evaluate this person when you can't really watch their facial reactions. Uh, you know, folks had different types of masks. We had one juror who wore pretty much a, a gaiter the whole time, which covered everything. Uh, and we had several jurors who wore uh, what I would think of as rather full masks as opposed to kind of a, a thinner, smaller mask. And, and you lost most of their face to the mask. So the usual sort of tells you might be looking for uh, from a a juror who's being questioned uh, or someone who's just sitting there watching things and you're looking at the body language or or looking at facial reactions. A lot of that was just gone. And and that makes it hard. And it it carried over certainly into witnesses and testimony. It's, it just made the whole trial different. I would, I would think that from a, a jury sort of research standpoint. You know, if you were going into a trial tomorrow where you had to deal with with these circumstances, uh, it's probably worth whatever effort it takes, at least in a potentially uh, large uh, verdict case, to put some resources into trying to get as much intel as possible on the jurors as soon as you learn uh, who the prospective folks might be. Because you may not get the feedback you're used to seeing during the trial or during jury selection. And every, every bit of info you could get in some other means may become all the more important because your usual route of watching and reading is, is different at the least and and maybe not existent at the worst. Yeah. And to add to that, I know that um, one of the parties at the trial I was at did have a jury consultant and I, I know it was, very difficult on her to do her job the way she's used to doing it uh, in evaluating jurors during the jury selection process. Uh, but also the mask issue itself came up as an a hardship type of issue or just a, a, another issue for why jurors may or may not want to 
sit on the jury. That was something that was asked a lot about during jury selection was, are you going to be able to sit through a three or four week trial uh, for, you know, eight plus hours a day, maybe with a mask on the entire time? Are you going to be comfortable? Are you going to, are you going to be able to pay attention and focus? Are you going to be sit, like constantly adjusting your mask and, and annoyed with it to the point where you're missing out on things? And that actually became a, a bit of an issue with multiple people just saying, no, I, I'm absolutely not comfortable with that. It's some, I'm thinking about it sitting right now. I can't get comfortable just sitting here. So yeah, I think I think the the mask issue, as much as anything, really impacted the way uh, everything went. Well, let me add to that too. That I think it's a it's actually a really interesting topic because we may not be done with masks, right? I mean, there may be folks who, going forward, even when there's no more guidance that, or requirements that we must or or should wear masks, there may be folks who decide they just sort of feel better wearing them. Uh, but even if that comes at a cost, uh, maybe it affects attention span, it affects uh, the ability to read their body language, facial uh, movements. It, it, and so going forward, there's a there's an uncertainty about how all that's going to happen. For as long as we're in the situation where masks are required, I think it puts enormous additional pressure on trial counsel to get through it because you know trials can be really annoying. Right? If, especially if you're the juror, because the stuff that the lawyers find fascinating and incredibly insightful and, and really you know riveting, they might think is just boring as heck and a waste of their time. And, and I don't know why they were talking about this for hours. And, and those are the normal dynamics. But in this situation where people are annoyed, maybe is a good way to put it, uh, at, at having to wear masks all day and, and just being in this setting where they probably don't really want to be, it's everything is is doubly annoying. So if you're if you're struggling to find your place, if you can't get the right questions for your witness, you don't have your exhibits lined up. Uh, anything that might take a little longer in terms of you know getting ready for testimony, eliciting the testimony, the questioning, if questioning just goes on and on and on, whatever was annoying before became twice as annoying. Well, that's that's a good lead into my next question. Um... Obviously, trials are likely to not go back to the way they used to be for a while, if ever, um, depending on jurors' personalities and concerns. Did you pick up any best practices to take from this experience into trials going forward, um, even when things, as they start to go back to normal or when they go back to normal? Are there any lessons learned that would be that you could take away to benefit the trial or benefit your advocacy during a trial. Well, I'll I'll echo what I started to say earlier about jury research. Uh, some places uh, you can get veneer info early and and learn who your prospective folks might be. And and if you're in one of those places, then being able to do some research on them in advance is probably even more significant than it was before. And if you can't get that info in advance, it, as soon as you can get it when you're in the room, uh, being able to run that down, having somebody outside who can, can start to do some work in order to make up for the lack of, of sort of transparency when it comes to just good old fashioned body language and, and facial uh, movements. I think that's a, a real big deal. And the rest of it to me all probably boils down to efficiency. It is it it's just so much more important to to be less annoying, right? And to be quicker about getting through things because so many folks are uncomfortable in these situations. And and that's hard on trial counsel because you know, there's a lot you want to do and there's a lot you want to get through and all the series of points you want to make. So it's a it's a balance that's it's always been hard to strike and now it's just harder yeah I, I think i would echo what matt said which is that for counsel you need to one you need to be more patient and not get frustrated with the, the process and the delays and you need to probably try to be as efficient as possible probably need to be as considerate as possible understanding that everyone is now dealing with this issue and to the extent on things that don't matter right the things that aren't actually impacting your case uh, working together is going to be more effective than, uh, you know, sort of being um, contentious on every minor little thing. Um, so I think that's helpful. But as far as other best practices, 
I think those are the kind of things we're going to really learn about more as this goes on, because these live trials are just um, starting again and in, and in places they may be different. Right. So not every now that we the guidance is changing, maybe we will see continued required mask use in some places, but maybe not in other places. And, and who knows if people start uh, or if different courts start changing uh, the distancing requirements. So I think those real best practices are going to be established as we go forward and have the ability to collect a little bit more data on these trials and how they're going. But I think the basic takeaways are, are just what Matt said. Try to be efficient, try to be considerate, uh, and, and, and try to make sure that you're, you're sort of respecting your jurors' time um, as you're going forward because you don't want them uh, getting angry at the process and somehow taking it out on either of the parties uh, if possible. Yeah, trials, especially multi-week trials, tend to take a lot of time as it is. And what I'm hearing is this is even more delay that so even more preparation from trial counselors perspective could be a good idea. I'll add one more, which is something that we touched on earlier. The lack of physical touching, right, with exhibits, passing things around, publishing things to the jury. In our courtroom, there was very little that was was handled or, or you had to be ready with with notebooks or whatever items the witness had to have in advance, uh, have that stuff at the witness's uh, seat before the person took the stand. And and you didn't have the ability to really pass anything to the jury and, and let them eyeball it in that way. So you had to be ready with the video, the screens, uh, whatever tech person is helping out to be able to present to the whole courtroom at one time, exactly where you wanted folks to focus. And it's a bit different. A lot of folks, you know, at times want to be able to, to, you know, move up to the jury, you know, hand people things, watch and see what they look at or what they don't look at. Uh, and I think certainly it, it today and in this moment, that's not happening. And and maybe going forward, it might not happen. It might be that we don't go back to some of those things. We're all appellate specialists. So we, we uh, participate in trial as, in a, as the appellate counsel. Did you uh, come up with or notice any issues with respect to preservation that were more difficult in, in a trial like this? Or was preservation typically dealt with the same way because you can obviously not stop from talking, but communication was harder. So with, with folks being spread around more, uh, not being able to whisper the same way, uh, was, was difficult. Other than that, I mean, as you said, so the, the preservation requirements are what they are. So we have to just make sure we're on top of those things, but the, to the extent there was a difference, I think it was just in the the difficulties in trying to communicate and not being able to, to sort of whisper the way traditionally you would. So obviously, as we've been saying, this is probably not going to end anytime soon. What is your overall impression? Do you think that um, these live trials are effective, even though um, they've got some delay issues as far as moving cases forward and making just sure justice is, you know, proceeding at as best it can. What is your overall feeling about trials like this going forward? I thought it was uh, overall a very positive experience. I think that even with all the difficulties and challenges that everyone faced, um, we ended up still with a good jury, an attentive jury that cared. They fought through it. They were willing to sort of put in the extra time that was necessary to, to get it done and to really consider everything before reaching a verdict. And at the end of the day, that's, you know, that's what we were looking for. We're looking for a, a fair trial with a, with a verdict. And we were able to get there. So I think that it is something that uh, will continue. Uh, I think that it will benefit the, the justice system to continue to have live trials. I think it was a, a net positive. Um, but, you know, just understanding that along the way you might face some difficulties that you haven't previously. And so I think just everyone's going to have to start to be prepared for that and, and spend more time prepping ahead of time than you already are, which is already a tremendous amount of prep, but maybe even a little more time prepping ahead of time for those things that, like Matt said, to make sure that you're, you're ready to present to the jury 
and present to the court as, as efficiently and as appropriately as you can. Um, and then other than that, just, you know, hope we can get to a verdict. Well, thank you both very much. I think that's very helpful. Um, hopefully it will shed some light on what these live trials are like, and we'll see what happens going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. This podcast is intended for general information and educational purposes only and should not be relied on as if it were advice about a particular fact situation.